We gather this morning called forth by love to find joy and comfort in one another, to bear each other's burdens and celebrate the mystery of life. Come, let us worship together. Reverently, I offer this symbol of our hot hope and high intent. Reverently, I bequeath this flame to you. This is the light that is lit for everyone who comes into the world. Bear this light to others, one by one. Let the flame go from life to life till all is lit with its warmth. Tell that the light means wisdom tell that the light means kindness tell that the light means understanding tell that the light means tolerance tell that the light means sacrifice tell that the light is a vision of a fairer world tell that this is the light that is lit for everyone who comes into the world We're going to sing hymn number, number 95, There Is More Love Somewhere. Oh, 
We continue this month's theme with the sixth principle, the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. How do we bring about a community of peace within our beloved community, our country, and in the world at large? Hey everyone, this morning's story is the Mishmash Heart, part of Love Connects Us. Recently, at a multi-generational event at a Unitarian Universalist congregation, everyone was encouraged to make a heart. They were given some construction paper and some glue and some markers to design their heart. Emily worked diligently to create the most perfect, beautiful heart she could. It even had glitter in the shape of diamonds all around the outside. As she was helping to clean up, she noticed the heart of one woman who was around the same age as her grandmother sitting at a nearby table. It was a mish-mash mess of odd colors and had pieces which were ripped and torn, glued haphazardly upon it. Parts of it were wrinkled and crinkled, and there was even a tear in it. Thinking there was something wrong, Emily offered to help the woman fix her heart. But the woman merely smiled and explained that there was nothing wrong with her heart. It revealed all the things which had happened to her in her life. She said there were happy times, the beautiful colors and designs represented when she first met her husband, their wedding and the birth of each of their three children. There were other beautiful parts too, which stood for watching her children take their first steps on their own, riding a bike for the first time and graduating from college. But what about all the rips and tears and wrinkles, Emily asked. Why are they there? These were for the sad times in life, the woman explained. The time her best friend was stricken with measles. The time she lied or did something to hurt someone's feelings. And the hurt that was left when her husband died. In fact, every time a person comes into my life that I care about, she explained, they take a piece of my heart with them. This was distressing to Emily, thinking of the woman having to give away part of her heart. But what happens when you give it all away, she asked. You'll be left with nothing. No, I won't, the woman responded with a smile. Because, you see, they give me a piece of theirs as well. Emily looked down at her beautiful, perfect heart with the glitter and the designs she worked so hard to make. And she looked again at the woman's mish-mashed heart with the jagged colors, rips, and wrinkles. Without hesitation, Emily ripped a piece off of her perfect heart and handed it to the woman. Thank you, the woman said as she placed it with her mish mash heart and tore off a piece to hand to Emily. The mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church is to be a free and welcoming religious community that encourages lives of integrity, learning, service, and joy. One way we live out this mission is by giving half our weekly offering to a nonprofit organization that shares our values and addresses needs in one of these areas, environmental action, economic justice, civic engagement, and racial justice we support a new organization each month. This month's plate collection recipient is BUC's Emerging Needs Fund. This fund is used to provide cash support for members of our congregation and others in need. This has been especially important during the past two years. If you are experiencing financial difficulty or other problems, please contact Reverend Mandy. This morning's offering will now be received with gratitude.
We are a church of open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. With gratitude, we dedicate this offering to the good works of our congregation and dedicate ourselves to its service. Each week we share our joys and sorrows with the congregation. Annis Pratt and her daughter Faith have a joy to share. Our European family arranged for the rescue of a Ukrainian family and are providing lodging for them after their safe arrival. Carol Jackson and Alex Sellis share the following. Our son Zach, who is stationed at Fort Benning, was able to come home last week for a pre-deployment visit. Because of Alex's illness, we never know whether Alex will still be able to recognize and communicate with Zach when he returns stateside. Zach took Alex for a wheelchair ride around the cul-de-sac in the snow. They went to the barber together so Alex, who had developed a Jerry Garcia look during the Omicron surge, could get both a shave and a haircut. And Zach barbecued in 37 degree weather because before he was stationed in Georgia, he was stationed in Alaska and he barbecued there in the winter. So why not in Michigan? We will of course miss him, but thank him for the beloved memories he left behind. Among life's joys, we also share in each other's sorrows. Liz Cranston, on behalf of Jean, Tom, and family, shares a sorrow. The Cranston family is saddened to share the news that Jean's mother, Mary Lee Vensky, passed away on February 28th. Mary Lee, a longtime member of the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Detroit community, was a kind and intelligent, humorous, and complicated woman. She faced more than her share of adversity at various moments in her life, but carried herself with strength, wit, and a fierce devotion to her family. We will miss her dearly. And Larry Larson shares, the most sorrowful news that I can remember is occurring in Ukraine. We hold these joys and sorrows as well as those not spoken in our hearts. This morning's prayer is by the recently departed Thich Nhat Hanh. Let us be at peace with our bodies and our minds. Let us return to ourselves and become wholly ourselves. Let us be aware of the source of being common to us all and to all living things. Evoking the presence of the great compassion, let us fill our hearts with compassion toward ourselves and towards all living beings. Let us pray that we ourselves cease to be the cause of suffering to each other. With humility, with awareness of the existence of life and of the sufferings that are going on around us, let us practice the establishment of peace in our hearts and on earth. Amen.
There is an unattributed quote making the rounds on social media that goes like this. I am washing my face before bed while a country is on fire. It feels dumb to wash my face and dumb not to. It has never been this way and it has always been this way. Someone has always clinked a cocktail glass in one hemisphere as someone loses a home in another while someone falls in love in the same apartment building where someone grieves. The fact that suffering, mundanity, and beauty coincide is unbearable and remarkable." End quote. This juxtaposition of the beautiful and terrible, the mundane and devastating, is often where we find ourselves when we look up from inside the confines of our own small patch of the world and broaden our lenses out across borders and continents and oceans on this tremendously large planet we live on. Because it's a big planet, but a small world. And the devastation of war and our modern day experience of it shows how both of these can be true at the same time. In this context, there could not be a more fitting time to consider our sixth UU principle the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. What does it mean to think of the world, this large planet and the 7.9 billion people on it, in terms of a community, a small world? How do we reconcile it when, as the quote says, someone clinks a cocktail glass in one hemisphere as someone loses a home in another? How do we feel? What do we do as members of a UU faith community when we are safe in our homes here in southeastern Michigan while Ukrainians are suffering tremendous loss and devastation halfway across the globe? Russia's invasion of Ukraine is in its third week. Missiles have fallen on multiple cities and Russian forces have attacked from land and sea. Violence is sweeping across the country cities and residential homes destroyed, people injured and killed. And as of this writing, more than two million refugees have fled Ukraine in search of safety. TV news and social media show people carrying their belongings, huddling under blankets against the wall in underground subways, crowding onto trains, saying tearful goodbyes to loved ones staying behind, and perhaps most disturbing of all, civilians, even children taking up weapons in resistance. In our technological age, war is more visible and present than ever. And so are the similarities between ourselves and the people suffering the horrors of war. A mere three weeks ago, some of the refugees fleeing their homes might have had dentist appointments, play dates, library books do, just like us. Big planet, small world. Yet, despite the horrifying images constantly scrolling across our TV screens and our social media feeds, it's not difficult to distance ourselves from faraway events that might not affect our day-to-day -day lives. In my March newsletter reflection, I mentioned another quote from author Roxanne Gay that touches on the disconcerting nature of world events that are simultaneously near and far, present in our living rooms and news feeds, but only until we change the channel or scroll to the next thing. Roxanne says, it is surreal what modernity offers. There's a war happening. People are in danger. The people of Yemen have been dealing with similar encroachments for years. There is Palestine and the impossible conditions Palestinians are living with. There are brutal conflicts taking place all over the world. We learn about them and care about them to one degree or another while going about our lives largely unaffected. It's a bit surreal." End quote. War has certainly shaped the lives of members of my family and the generations before me. Both of my grandfathers served in World War II, my paternal grandfather in the Army, and my maternal grandfather as a Navy pilot patrolling the coasts of the US and Cuba in PBY flying boats. 
My dad was eligible to be drafted to Vietnam, but he had an educational deferment and later an inner ear syndrome that kept him from going over. However, despite these lived experiences of war, no one in my family was ever in the kind of danger Ukrainians are in now. In the community I lived in growing up and the one I live in now, outdoor warning sirens are tested on the first Saturday of every month. When I was growing up, my mom, a baby boomer and daughter of the Navy pilot, called these air raid sirens. I don't remember asking her about that at a time in my life when I certainly didn't understand what air raids or airstrikes were. I wouldn't have been old enough to remember hearing those sirens until the early to mid 1980s. And some perfunctory Googling tells me that the civil defense air raid systems in the US was dismantled in the 1970s. Most cities no longer have an operable air raid system. The outdoor warning sirens I hear tested today are for dangerous weather conditions like a tornado. I have only read about airstrikes in books and seen footage and fictional de depictions on TV. I have never experienced one like the people of Ukraine are experiencing now. So back to my question, what does world community mean in this modern age when people around the planet Ukrainian war refugees, starving Yemeni children, injured Palestinian protesters can be in our living rooms with us. How do we as you use in the spirit of our sixth principle respond to the troubles of this big planet with the values of the small world community. I don't have any easy answers. Sometimes all we can do is bear witness, not turn away from the suffering of our world community, pray, and take a stand with the power of our votes, our privilege, and our pocketbooks. And one thing I've learned after six months examining our UU principles is how they are all connected. We can't begin to imagine world community without remembering our first and second principles that all people have inherent worth and dignity and are worthy of justice, equity, and compassion. Or the seventh principle, that we are all part of an interdependent web of existence. It's by remembering and living all of our principles that we can ever hope to achieve the aspirational goal of the sixth principle on this big planet, small world.
We, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. When I started considering the sixth principle, my first thought was, why do we even have the sixth principle? Isn't this all covered elsewhere? First principle, the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Second principle, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. Seventh principle, respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. What is unique about the sixth principle? I think it's the first few words, the goal of a world community with peace. Let's take a few minutes to put ourselves back in the early 60s and the development of these principles with the unification of the Unitarian and Universalist congregations. World War II and the first use of atomic weapons was only 15 years prior. At the end of that war, nuclear scientists who had worked on the Manhattan Project that developed the first atomic bombs contributed to the Atchison Leidenthal Report. Per a well-documented source on Wikipedia, quote, the primary message of the report was that control of atomic energy through inspections and policing operations was unlikely to succeed. Instead, the report proposed that all fissile material be owned in it by an international agency to be called the Atomic Development Authority, which would release small amounts to individual nations for the development of peaceful uses of atomic energy." End quote. Looking back, perhaps this seems naive at the time, happening while the United Nations was just being formed. Due to the rapid polarization that was developing between the US and the USSR, this proposal quickly fell apart and the atomic weapons race was on. By 1960, it was front and center in people's minds that the sheer destructive capacity of nuclear weapons made any future wars that were fought with them to be an existential threat to humanity. It was in this context that the forming UUA recognized the importance of a world community that must live in peace as one of our core principles. The US and USSR worked to agree to some limitations on nuclear weapons over the subsequent years, but nuclear weapons production moved forward at a rapid pace. One by one, these agreements have been expired or been abandoned. With the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989, while scrambling had to be done to make sure some of the former Soviet socialist republics didn't end up as failed states with nuclear weapons, the overall feeling was that nuclear war was much less a threat. In our hubris, we believe that our role as the only remaining superpower removed the threat of this destructive capacity that now exists in nine countries. While pacifism, nuclear disarmament, and world peace were front and center in the 1960s, progressives and religious communities have pretty much abandoned any focus on this issue anymore. We woke up in late February to an invasion of Ukraine by one of the lar three largest nuclear powers in the world. It certainly doesn't appear that Russia will stop with Ukraine. It is also clear that not only are we naive about the existential risk of another world war, but we also have significant political leaders who are siding with Russian aggression because it plays to their own personal interests. I entered my teens in the 1960s. My parents were involved in the civil rights movement and I followed the nonviolent philosophy of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. when it came to social justice. As the Vietnam War escalated and I looked ahead to the draft that would become a problem for me a few years hence, I decided that I was pacifist and I began to apply for conscientious objector status. I worked with the priests in my parish to articulate my beliefs. However, while I was reading Thoreau, Gandhi, and King, I was not a member of an explicitly pacifist church, such as the Quakers. If I wanted to apply for conscientious objector status as a Catholic, I had better understand Catholic theology. This led me to an understanding of Thomas Aquinas's just war theory. In Summa Theologica, the go-to book for Catholic theology from the 12th to the 20th centuries, Aquinas asserted that it is not always a sin to wage war and set out criteria for a just war. 
Based on my understanding of these criteria, the Vietnam War was not a just war. Fortunately for me, the draft lottery of 1972 yielded me a very high number. In other words, unless World War III had started, I was not going to be drafted. Strangely enough, or is it just maturity, while peace is the long-term goal, I tend to follow Thomas Aquinas more today than when I was a pacifist in the 60s and 70s. And while I marched against the Vietnam War starting in my freshman year of high school and believed that the only way to change the world was through direct political action, I've come to see that there are multiple dimensions to the struggle to achieve world peace. One of these is to learn how to build a commu beloved community. I learned the importance of engagement in a church community from my parents' example as I was growing up. And if there is any reason for engagement in the church, it is the role of community in the experience of transcendence. Transcendence is found not just in personal prayer and meditation. It is also not just a commitment to social justice in the broader community. It includes both of these. But there is an additional form of transcendence to be found in the formation of a beloved community. The beloved community acts as a training ground, a place to practice that which we want to see come alive on a broader and broader scale, up to and even including a goal of world community. From my parents' perspective, if you're in a community, then you're all in. That doesn't mean spending every waking moment in church work, but it and it doesn't mean overcommitting and burning out, but it does mean active engagement, not only passive Sunday morning receipt of the benefits without a corresponding contribution. That contribution takes different forms for different people, but at its core, the challenge to each of us is to share our time, talent, and treasure with the church community. At this time of year, when we are asked to document how much of our treasure we will commit to this, contribute to this community, I challenge us to also consider what we are offering of our time and talent. Being in a community is not just a transactional relationship. The miracle of adding your time and talent to the mix is that you will get to experience the spiritual transcendence that is in the beloved community. And perhaps this beloved community can become our training grounds for how to strive for the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. We're going to sing hymn number 190, Light of Ages and of Nations.
Go now into this world as a beacon of hope and joy. Go in love, go in peace. Now that our worship has ended, our service begins. May it be so. Amen. Blessed